have you today at the kickoff, no pun intended, kickoff of our You Asked For It series. And I want to explain what this series is, but before I do that, I want to take a second, look into the camera and say welcome to all of you who are joining us online. Wherever you are, we are glad you are here with us today. Vineyard, would you help me welcome those who are joining us online? We love you. We're glad you're here. Well, as I said, this series is called You Asked For It, and today we are kicking that off. This is part one of that series. And this series was actually inspired by Jesus Christ himself. You know, Jesus would often uh, receive questions from the crowd or the disciples that were traveling with him, or, uh, and they would ask him a question, and he would respond, and it would turn into a beautiful sermon or a message. And so we've taken after Jesus in that way. We're, we're following his example. And so we've taken questions from you guys. We did a survey on Easter, and we collected questions from you and topics you want to talk about, and crafted this series specifically for you. So if you invited somebody on Easter Sunday uh, to church, this is a great series to invite them back to because we're discussing the things they wanted to talk about because we handed out that survey and over the summer built this series just for them. And the goal is to cover material that is relevant to you, that applies to you. You know, we try to be as relevant and authentic as possible here at Vineyard Church. It's a part of who we are. It's a part of our mission statement. What the, we say it's why we exist, uh, and I wanted to share that with you. If you know it, you're welcome to say it with me. Well, why we exist, we exist to be a contemporary extension of the good news of Jesus Christ to our world and to help people find and fulfill God's purpose for their lives. Awesome. That's, that's why we exist. That's why this church exists. And so our goal in being contemporary, we believe this series helps us in that effort. So as I said, we did a survey on Easter. We collected your responses. Hey, what do you want to talk about? And so we put together your most asked questions, the top uh, responses for topics you wanted to discuss with us. And that's what we'll be discussing over the next few weeks. And we're going to bring to the table uh, God's best plan for you, what it says in his word about the topics you wanted to talk about. Because you asked for it. So that's why we're going to do that. All right. So here's the question. Here's this one was on almost every survey. This was a huge topic you guys wanted to talk about. Huge question. It's how do I handle stress? How do I, is anybody stressed ever in here? (laughs) First service hands were like praise. (laughs) They're all up all over. Stress is a big part of life and it doesn't take a brainiac to know the world is uh, more stressed than ever. Between Ukraine, COVID, inflation, it just goes on and on. There's a lot of places that we can find stress. You know, I did a little study for you this week, some research. They have some stress institutes, if you didn't know that, that do studies on stress. And one of the statistics that jumped out to me was, you know, this year they did some surveys and some studies and found that 55% of Americans are stressed, experience stress every day. So what that means, if the person to your right isn't stressed, the one to your left is. And if they're both not stressed, you are. (laughs) Another crazy statistic was that one out of five people experience extreme stress every day. What that means is it affects you physically, whether shaking or your heart's beating faster than it should, you're having trouble sleeping, you're depressed. That's pretty epidemic if you ask me intense. And they also said that 60% of all illnesses root in stress, that we're getting sick because of stress that contributes to it. And so I would say this is a pretty relevant topic. It's, it's pretty serious. The good news, though, is that the Bible says a lot about this topic, it has a lot to say about this topic. Well, I like to, when we cover a topic like this, isolate some of the areas, some of the sources of stress. And so that's what I would do. I put together a list for you. This isn't on your outlines, but I wanted to share this list with you. And it's not comprehensive. There's probably some more areas that we find stress, but probably most of you will find yourself in one or two of these places. Here's the first one. This one's a big one. It's relationships. Those cause stress often. And this was on all over the surveys you guys sent us as well. How do I forgive people? How do I deal with difficult people? People, they drive me up a wall. How do I work with that? Relationships can cause a lot of stress, right? And then another one is conflict. A lot of time that's the conflict in those relationships. That can cause stress. 
Um, one specific relationship that seems to cause stress sometimes is I'm married. <laughs> that can cause, some of you are saying my stress is next to me right now. Don't put your hands up. And so <laughs> there's a whole group of people that's saying that, hey, I'm married, and that causes stress. Then there's another group of people that says I'm stressed because I'm not married. <laughs> so you've got one group saying one thing, another group saying another. You've also got uh, deadlines. Those cause stress. Some of you right now are students thinking of homework assignments due tonight and some projects due in the coming weeks. Some of you have work projects that are coming up shortly. Deadlines can cause a lot of stress. There's also legal problems. That's a huge one. That can cause some stress, uh, whether that's something like a divorce going on in your home, the separation. That can cause a lot of stress. Then some say, actually, my stress comes from my new job, the new challenges, the new people I have to work with, there's just a lot of new things, and that causes stress. And then some people say, no, it's not the new job, it's actually the old job <laughs> that's causing me stress. And just, you know, that's another place. Then we have illnesses. We talked about that one. Illnesses can cause stress. And remember, this one actually roots 60% of our illnesses come from our stress. And then when we're sick, we get more stressed. And it's just kicking you while you're down, adds insult to injury. Then you've got parenting. Can I get an amen? <laughs> that can be very stressful. Olivia and I had our daughter Lily uh, almost one year ago, uh, coming up in a few weeks. And uh, this last year, it's been a ride. <laughs> it's sunshine and sunflowers, and then the next moment is somebody's going to die. I mean, <laughs> it's stressful, let me tell you. It is not for the faint of heart. It's stressful. So there's parenting, but then there's also what expectations of others. That can be stressful, right? Everybody seems to need something from you. Everybody wants something from you. And often, you know, people want things from you that really only God can give them, but they expect it from you. So that can add a lot of pressure, a lot of stress. Then there's unresolved sin. That's a big one. Uh, carrying the weight of shame and guilt with you around, that's heavy. It really is. And here, listen to me on this one. If you're here today and that, that one is a source of stress for you, you do not have to leave with that. You can leave it here. You can put it at the foot of Jesus and you do not have to leave here with that weight, okay? I'm serious. That's big because I know how heavy that can be. That can be a big stressor. Well, one final stressor that's just huge. This one's big. It's um, <laughs> the Steelers. I'm a Steelers fan, if you didn't know. It's, it's stressful. Somebody's hallelujah back there. <laughs> it can be, there's a lot of sources of stress, aren't there? A lot of sources of stress. But, you know, God has a way for us through that. He does. And I think Christians often get confused that, hey, I started following Jesus. Doesn't that mean all my problems are supposed to go away? Isn't he supposed to take care of my problems? And they won't say it that way, but they'll say it some way like this, where it's, Samuel, I've been coming to church every Sunday this month, and my problems haven't gone away. <laughs> well, hey, I'm sorry. That's just not how it works. That's actually bad theology. That's not what being a Christian is. Jesus actually said the opposite, to be honest. He said this. This verse is not in your notes, but I wanted to share it with you. It says, this is Jesus talking. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. That's key. We'll come back to that. In this world you will have what? Trouble. There's going to be trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world, Jesus said. See, God's solution is not to take away your problems, but instead to help you find peace, find rest in the middle of your problems in the middle of the storms. See, I can't guarantee you that when you leave today, your circumstances will change. I just can't, I'm sorry. But I can guarantee you that God has peace. He has rest for you in the middle of your circumstances. He does, he really does. And so my goal, my hope for today is that you leave with some biblical promises, some biblical principles that if you apply these and you start to follow them, that's God's way, this will radically change your life. It will, I promise you. And so in this effort to find rest, find the peace Jesus is talking about here, you know, I did some searching through the scriptures. Hey, how do I find rest? How do I handle stress? I just need some rest. How do I find that? And so I was reading through the scriptures, and I came across this passage in Psalms that's a book in the Bible that's almost dead center in the bi of your Bible. And I just fell in love with it, honestly. I just fell in love with this passage. And so much so that I decided when I was writing this message, I wanted you guys, wherever you are, whatever seat you're in, to read it aloud with me, okay? Wherever you are watching online, read it aloud too. And let's say it with some gusto, all right? All right, so here we go. We're going to read it together. It's from Psalms. Here we go. Find rest, O my soul, 
in God alone. My hope comes from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will not be shaken. Keep reading. My salvation, my honor depend on God. He is my mighty rock, my refuge. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your hearts to him, for God's our refuge. Great, excellent, excellent. And what that word is there at the end, Selah, that, if you don't know what that word means, that's a Hebrew musical term that is actually found in Psalms 77 times. And what that means, the Psalms, the Psalms, we just read it together, often those were actually sung. Those were sang. They sang them. And Selah, it's the musical term, the Hebrew musical term, would mean, okay, the band's going to do that again. They're going to go back and play that again but we're not going to say anything this time. We're going to pause and we're going to reflect. The word literally means to think on these things. And friends, I'm so glad you're here today. I believe church is a place of peace, a place of rest, that you can find rest just for a minute from your week, a a chance to uh, reorient your thinking from all the pains, the problems, the signals. The world is just bombarding you every day, every moment from your phone to television. It's just all on your face 24-7. And church is a place where you can come and just, hmm, I'm going to pause and reflect on the goodness of God. And that's my heart is that you would do that and that the strength of God would come inside of you, that you would leave with that strength. And so that's my heart is that we slow down a little bit today and we're able to capture that. You know, I was talking to a worship team member a few weeks ago. There's this young woman, she was getting ready to serve and you know, I know her pretty well. I know her story. I've been in her, I was in her small group a couple years back, and I just know how busy she is. She's in the medical field, works tons of hours, is married, is just frankly very busy. And so I was telling her, thank you just for serving on the dream team, and just, you know, I knew, I, I felt she was sacrificing a lot because I knew how busy she was. You know, honestly, guys, her response caught me off guard. When she responded to me, it, ca- it caught me off guard. She looked at me and smiled and was like, Samuel, Honestly, this isn't for you. It's for me. I was like, excuse me? What? (laughs) And then she's like, no, no, really, this is for me. I'm so busy. I couldn't make it through my week without serving here once a week. I I find rest here. I was like, wow, wow. This is a place of rest, guys. It really is. It's a place of rest. And, you know, as I was searching through the scriptures this week on this topic of rest, I came across another passage that I wanted to share with you with this topic of how do I handle my stress? How do I get rest in my soul? How do I get rest in my soul so I'm at peace? It says this in Jeremiah. It says, this is what the Lord says. Now, I'm going to pause real quick. I want you to hear it this way. Don't hear it as, oh, we're just reading the Bible together. Don't hear it as, this is what Samuel says. This is what God says to your stress. This is what the Lord says. Stand at the crossroads. In other words, You can keep going the way you are going, or you can change direction. There's a choice to make. Ask for the ancient paths. What that means is, hey, you could keep going the way you are going, or you could go back to some old-fashioned biblical principles that actually work. God's way works. That's why you're here, right? Amen? God's way works. So, but we have to make a decision. Ask where the good way is and walk in it, and you will, there's that phrase again, Find rest for your souls. Find rest for your souls. You know, I'll meet with people and they'll talk to me about, you know, just how they're stressed and overwhelmed and they'll come to me, hey, Samuel, I just need to, I need help figuring out this. And often it leads to a place time and time again of, I just don't have enough time or money. If those two were solved, that everything would work out. And so they'll come up to me and say, hey, what time management plan are you using nowadays? How do you figure out how to fit it all in? What budgeting app are you using? Where are you investing your money? How do you make it go further? And the reality is, you know, I, I, you could, I could share those things with you. They're not bad. But really, for everybody, it's a little different anyways. So I'd rather give you guys biblical principles, some, some things to apply to your life, that if you follow these things, you apply these things to your life, you will figure it out. You'll figure it out. So that's what I want to do. I want to give you three biblical principles that we see And so here's the first one. It always begins. In other words, you'll never know how to spend your resources, your time, or your money until you start to, number one, live with a sense of purpose and urgency. Purpose and urgency. 
In other words, let me say it this way. You won't know to do what, how to do what with your life, what to do with your life, until you figure out what your life is about. Until you figure out what God created you to do. And when you start to figure that out, I'm telling you, it becomes easier to say yes and no. Because then your time and money decisions aren't based on, you know, oh, what can I fit in? It's based on, does this contribute to my purpose? Does that make sense? Does this contribute to my purpose? In other words, oh, I'm sorry, I can't do that. I can't go out with you Friday night. That doesn't contribute to my purpose. I can't stay out that late. You know, oh, I can't spend money on that. It doesn't contribute to my purpose. And see, really, if you think about it, I know I've only got a few years left. That's right. Even as a young person, the Bible talks about how life is but a breath. <sighs> James 4, it's a mist. Here today, gone tomorrow. Life is brief, friends. And we only have so much time to live out the purpose God has given us. I'm a man of purpose. You're a person of purpose. And so, okay, Sam, how do I live intentionally towards that purpose? Well, you can't unless you know what that purpose is. And I think that's one of the greatest gifts Vineyard Church gives you guys is a pathway to discover your purpose. You know, some, we call it here our vision. Really, it's what we do, though. It's what we do as a church and really, this is God's vision for your life anyways. It's not ours. I didn't come up with it. Church didn't come up with it. It's really God's vision. You see this in the Bible time and time again, that this is his vision for your life. And we say it this way. The first one is that you would know God. In other words, you would fall in love with Jesus Christ. You would fall in love with God. And we want to help you do that. We want to teach you how to pray. Come to Saturday morning prayer. Come to prayer small groups. People will come up to me, how do I hear the Lord? We'll teach you. Come on, start praying with us. We want to teach you how to seek his face. We want to teach you how to learn to read the Bible so it's not just a book on the shelf that has some good ideas. No, it's actually the living word that guides your life. I want to teach you how to read it that way. Come to church every chance you get. Come hang with life-giving people, culture of life-giving that pours into your cup, doesn't take out of your cup. We want you to love God, to just know God, to fall in love with Jesus. Here's why. This is important. Don't miss this, church. Because he's the only one who can bring clarity to your life. Yeah. He is. He's the only one. So, but once you do that, once you begin that relationship with God, it's the most important, but it's also the easiest. Once you do that, we want you to start to settle your yesterdays so that you can move into what God has for you tomorrow. We want you to find freedom is how we say it. See, all of us have some issues, some roadblocks, some hang-ups, some addictions, some bad habits we've got to root out of our lives. And the Bible's prescription for that is relationships with other Christians. James 5, 16 says, Confess your sins, share your shortcomings with one another, and you will be healed. See, we all need a place where we can take off the metaphorical mask and just be real. Be real. Be authentic with others. And so we do that here through small groups. We do that through small groups. That's groups that meet here at church throughout the week and all throughout our community. That's the place where we take the time, because this is a big gathering. This is an important place, but you need a place where people know your name and your face also. And that's where small groups come in. And the hope, my prayer is that at some point, probably it won't happen week one, I'm telling you, that'd be crazy. If week one, you were able to share just everything right off the bat. My hope is that you build up confidence over the weeks. And by week four or five, then you start to trust, you build up confidence in people, or at least you see they have as many loose screws as you do, and you're like, well, <laughs> we're going together, I guess. But you can start to, hey, can I tell you something? You get to that place, because hear me, hear me on this one. When you share that, you will, and you receive prayer, you will be healed. You will, I promise you, I promise you. And that's freedom, not having to carry that. You know, we just kicked off our fall semester of small groups. It began last week. It was the first week. Most groups came and met for first Wednesday. We had a service here on the first Wednesday of the month. So most groups are meeting for the very first time this coming week. So that's your, if you know God, that's your next step is to get in a group. Okay, Samuel, how do I do that? Well, write this down on your outline. Or if you're a phone user, pull out your phone, pull out the web browser. And what you're going to type in is or write down is vineyardchurch.com slash small groups vineyardchurch.com slash small groups on there you can find the directory of groups we have over 40 groups happening this semester there's a pl there's even a group i was told in between services last service there's a group how to handle your stress so <laughs> if you need this part two go to that group there's a group for you 
Another way is after service, ask any dream teamer. They're the people wearing blue name tags or the white ones. Ask them, uh, hey, what group are you in? And they'll tell you. They'll share. They'll invite you to their group. They'll, tell you, they'll show you how to get on the directory, how to browse that, how to contact the leaders. Okay, Samuel, but what if it's the wrong group? Hey, it takes time. One of my favorite stories is of a young woman who served on our production team. She tried five different groups before finding her words, the perfect group. It was a women in management group that she found, and she felt right at home. But don't miss it, five different groups. That's assuming she did one a week. That's a month. <laughs> that's a, Samuel, that's a lot of work. Anything worthwhile is uphill. Let me say it this way. A friend easily gained is a friend easily lost. It takes some work. It really does. It really does. So our hope is that you would get friendships where you can begin to share and walk through life and we say find freedom and then the next step our goal is that you would get in what we call growth track so that you can discover your purpose how God created you and growth track happens every Sunday it's a four-step process today is step two as Bernicia said come right after service be a part of that Uh, it doesn't matter if you didn't come to step one just get in the process get in the process because life is not worth living if you don't know your purpose it's just not, so don't wait any longer. We give lunch, child care, it's less than an hour. And what we do in that is we just show you how God created you and how you're supposed to use your giftings. And hear this, the wisdom of life is found in the elimination of non-essentials. So when you figure out why you're on this planet, that starts to make sense. What is a part of your purpose and what isn't? For example, over this past year, I've really started to figure out, I kind of mentioned it earlier, that my Friday nights, I'll get offers to go out to late night dinners or go out to late night movies, and I love the movies. I do. I love them. It's a a way to find rest for me. I love movies. But Friday nights, you know, I've just found that my my Friday nights affect my Saturday mornings. They do. And my purpose is actually Saturday morning prayer, not Friday nights. And so I've had to start to decline those. Hey, thanks. Oh, well, we'll pay for you. No, no, thanks. I need to be ready to go for Saturday morning prayer. And people, you know, I had a friend a couple months ago say, well, can't, don't you have people work for you or can't they cover that for you? Man, that's a big bummer, man. That's a sacrifice. And I was like, no, it's really not. It's actually a joy because that's what I was created to do. There is nothing more fulfilling than finding why you are on this planet and then starting to walk that out. So go to growth track, get in the process, start to discover how you were made so that you can do what you were called to do, which is finally make a difference. Make a difference. And this is what we do at step four. You get on a team and you don't just create clarity in your life, but you create clarity to your Sundays. The Bible describes you in Ephesians 4 as ministers. That's right, I'm not the minister, you're the ministers. <laughs> and it actually says ministers, that, you know, that word when translated, it actually means to serve that you serve people. That's what Jesus did. He's, ser- he's servant evangelism, servant leader. He served. And so we equip you through Growth Track how, and that's not just a church. It's really not. Most church happens between Sundays. It does. So when you discover your purpose, how God created you, you bring your giftings home. It's not like you leave them at church. You bring them home to your family. You bring them into your workplace. And get this, it's important. When you start to do that, what happens is you start to see you're changing lives. Like, people are going to heaven because of the stuff you're doing. That brings your stress level down. It really does. It brings your stress level down. Here's some verses to encourage you. Lord, if you're a note taker, right, right, right behind this, good verse to pray. <laughs> Lord, Remind me how brief my time on earth will be. Remind me that my days are numbered and that my life is fleeing away. My life is no longer than the width of my hand. An entire lifetime is just a moment to you. Human existence is what? A breath. A breath. It's fleeting. Here today, gone tomorrow. We have to live with purpose and urgency. I love this parable. This is Jesus talking about that. He's specifically addressing time and finances in this one. He says, The kingdom of heaven, this is Jesus talking, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. In other words, you have a purpose, and when you find it, it's like treasure. It's valuable. But you got to go find it. 
you got to go find it. And when a man found it, this is Jesus, he hid it again. And then in his joy, went and sold all he had and bought that field. In other words, when he figured out what his purpose was, he gave his life to it. He gave everything to that. And that's what my hope is that you are able to live the rest of your lives doing that thing. Well, what is the field, Samuel? What is the field? Well, the field, the answer to that is things that last forever. Things that last forever. You're going to wish when all of this is over and you're standing before Jesus that you did things, you made a difference in things that actually lasted, that lasted in eternity. See, we're called not just to make a difference, because I know some companies use that slogan. No, it's different in the church. It's an eternal difference. In other words, it impacts people. It impacts people. So that's your first principle, is live with a sense of purpose and urgency. Here's your second one. The second one is that after we do that, we discover our purpose, and we start to live with that urgency. The next thing is, the reality is there's just not enough time to do everything. So we have to put first things first. We've got to put first things first. We do actually use, a lot of our staff use something called a full focus planner. And in that is the daily thing that has all the planner things. But w- the key thing about it is it has three, they call it your big three. It's three things you do, you're committing to do today. It helps you put first thing first. And really that's birthed from, we have behaviors here at Vineyard we cultivate that actually creates our life-giving culture. It's, we have values is what some people call them. It's love God, love people, pursue excellence, and choose joy. That pursue excellence one, one of the ways we do that is by doing few things well. In other words, instead of doing a lot of things terribly, <laughs> I'm going to do a few things well. Because there's a lot of things to do, aren't there? Lots of options, lots of opportunities, lots of social media, lots of TikTok videos to watch, lots of Netflix shows to catch up on. There's a lot. But you have to make a decision to put first things first because it just won't all fit in. It won't. And so I've made a decision to put Olivia first, to put God first, to put my family first, to put my church first, you guys, I put you first. And then if I have room for all those other things, not necessarily bad, great, I'll do them, but I've just got to put first things first. Here's a great verse to pray. It says, teach us to number our days and recognize how few they are. Help us to spend them as we should. How should we spend them? Well, Jesus says, Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. In other words, put God's stuff first. Put God's stuff first. And then what happens? He takes care of the rest. He takes care of everything else. And so if we put God first in our time and our money and our resources, he will take care of the rest. And you know, this isn't a message about money or finances, but I'd be remiss to not share that, you know, when you put God first in your finances, it changes a lot. It really does. Olivia and I have made a decision to tithe off of every paycheck we get, 10% of the gross, right to God, the local church. That's this church for us. And, you know, we know, we do that because we know God, putting God first in that area is so much more valuable than that 10% ever could be. You know, last year, uh, 2021, we uh, got those stimulus checks. And Pastor Andy, when the first round came out, Pastor Andy encouraged everybody to pray about whether they needed that or not, and if they didn't, to pray if that was supposed to be an offering uh, to the church. Specifically, he opened up one of our legacy lanes. We have a legacy team that has the gift of giving, and he opened up a legacy lane to everybody uh, about the capital project. One of our capital projects is the elevator, and he, you know, prayed us, encouraged us to pray about that. And that's what Olivia and I did. We prayed about it, and we decided that was for us to give that as an offering. So we did. And, um, you know, Olivia at this time was about seven ish months pregnant, and uh, so we were both working two different jobs, so we had two cars, and then a few weeks after we gave that stimulus check, one of our cars decided to take a break for a while, <laughs> of course, decided to rest. Can I say I was a little stressed? And honestly, being honest, I was a little frustrated at God. I was like, what the heck, God? Come on. What is going on? Just being honest. And, um, you know, a couple... Shortly after the car broke down, it felt like forever, but it was probably only a few days afterwards, um, some people very near and dear, so close to my heart, uh, decided to give Olivia and I their van, one of their vans for free. 
and they, it was just a huge blessing. God takes care of us, and I would share who they are. I think they, most of you, a lot of you would know who they are, but I know them extremely well, and they wouldn't want this story to be about them, or me, or Olivia for that matter. They'd want it to be about God, that God put it on their hearts to do that. That's only something God does. It really is. God takes care of you. He will. So we have to put first things first, not just in our finances, in our time. Start your day off. Do you start your day off with prayer? Start your day off with prayer. Start your weekend off with prayer. Come to Saturday morning prayer. Dream team, show up on time for your serve so you can start with prayer. This is why, don't miss this, that's actually the most important part of your serve. It actually is. We have to put first things first. It's just a decision because it won't all fit in. It won't, right? So we have to live with a purpose. We have to discover that purpose and then live with urgency. Then we have to make a decision to put first things first. That's just a decision we have to make. And this last one, this is huge. This is the last principle I'm going to leave you with. The last point is that we have to keep our hearts set on heaven. Keep our hearts set on heaven. Note takers, write this down under that. Write this down. Lower my expectations of earth. Lower my expectations of earth. And this one sucked me in. I really think it's an American gospel that we slip into. See, earth was never intended to be heaven. It wasn't. And we pray kingdom come, and we do want the kingdom to break through, so there's healing and salvations and, you know, uh, miracles. But earth is not heaven. And when we set that expectation on earth, you will stay stressed. Because what happens is when somebody dies or passes away, we're just in despair. They're gone. They left. I wanted them here. But really, if you keep your eyes fixed on heaven, you go, no, 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 no. They're actually, they didn't leave me here. I'm going there at some point. You know, Queen Elizabeth II just died this weekend. And uh, very sad. And there's been a lot of posts online about just the despair and, oh, my gosh. And, you know, it is sad. Don't get me wrong. But did you know Queen Elizabeth II was a Christian? She shared in a Christmas address one year that she uh, followed the, Jesus was the guiding light to her life, is what she said. So Queen Elizabeth, you know, it's fair, it is sad she's gone. But I'm going to see her again someday. I'm going to where she is. In fact, Hebrews talks about how she's watching you right now, cheering you on. A great host surrounds you, cheering you on in your faith race. Isn't that cool? The queen is cheering you on. That's pretty cool. See, an eternal perspective, it changes things, doesn't it? Changes how we see things. It does. You know, I honestly think that other countries get this better than we do. You know, when we go to Mazalan, Mexico, in, in January with the mission small groups, we go down there and we do ministry for 11, 14 days. Powerful. If you haven't done it, I encourage you to go. If finances are a problem, come talk to us. We'll remove that from you. We want you to go. It's powerful. But, you know, guys, when I'm down there and I see these orphans who are running around in these literal mud huts they built with their hands and tin roofs and just, and, and these kids who have disease and don't know where their next meal is coming from, they are happier than ever with a stick. They're running around with a stick laughing. And they are happier than any kid with 12 digital devices here. Why? Because their hope is in the right thing. They didn't put their hope in the wrong thing. So we corral these kids into the Lavinias. That's the vineyard churches we built down there. And they just sing, and it breaks your heart, guys. It really does, in a good way. To watch them, these kids sing, Jesus, Jesus, I can't wait to be with you. And they're singing about heaven. And it's not in despair, it's in joy and expectation. They have their eyes fixed on Jesus, on heaven, where they're going. That's where they find that peace, that rest. It's powerful. It really is. What if we looked at life that way? With not just focusing on the problems we have here, but with joy and expectation for what is to come. Paul says it this way. Paul wrote most of the New Testament. He wrote letters, and he says it this way. Are you stressed? Well, Paul says, therefore, don't lose heart. I don't lose heart. Don't lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, in other words, things are literally decaying in front of your eyes right now. All hell is breaking loose. Everything's going bad. Yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. 
goes on to say this, Paul talking, and for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Light and momentary troubles. I don't know about you, but it doesn't always feel light and momentary to me. How does Paul do that? Well, he tells us. So we fix our eyes, not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen, what's going on here is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. You know, the disciples came to Jesus and asked him this question uh, 2,000 years ago, and there you asked for it series. (laughs) They came up and said, how do we handle stress, Jesus? You know how Jesus responded? Jesus said this, do not let your hearts be troubled. He's talking to his disciples. Trust in who? God. Trust also in me. That's Jesus. Then look where he goes. Catch this. He doesn't say, okay, guys, let's break for a prayer huddle. No. He actually, look where he goes. In my father's house, he's talking about heaven. In my father's house, there are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. So Jesus, I'm sorry if you came to this message and were like, hey, I was hoping to let go of all my problems and t- those would go away. I'm sorry, that's not how it is. Jesus says there is going to be troubles, but you can have peace. You can find rest in the midst of that. How we do that is we live with purpose and urgency because that helps filter out the noise in our life that causes stress. We put first things first because you just can't fit it all on the plate. There's not enough time, not enough money in the world for you to do it all. We have to put first things first. And then finally, we keep our eyes fixed on heaven. Things that are unseen, the eternal, we need to walk with an eternal perspective at all times. You know, the Bible calls, when you do this, the Bible describes it as you will achieve blessed hope. In other words, your hope isn't in things around you here on earth. Your hope is in heaven. You're longing, you're hoping for something to come. And at the end of the day, I want to leave you with this. I didn't want to just leave you with the principles, but I want to leave you with this thought. You know, Jesus offers more than a better now. It's more than just a better now. Jesus offers a better place, a better place. And so the most important decisions you'll make today is are you ready to go to that place? If Jesus came back today, Are you ready to go to that place? Let's bow our heads and close in prayer. Lord, we just thank you for what you are doing here in this room, in this moment. Lord, for those watching online, Holy Spirit, would you go and just speak to them as well? I just want us to be still for a moment, all of us, wherever you are. And I want you to ask the Holy Spirit, that's God's presence, his spirit, ask him this, What are you trying to do? What are you trying to tell me? Just ask that. The Bible describes the Lord's voice as not in the fires or the earthquakes or the wars. It's the small whisper, the still small whisper. So God, I just pray for every person in here, Lord, that those who have the ears to hear and the eyes to see, would you open their eyes and open their ears to hear your words? Yes, Jesus. Yeah, that the, wor- the things of their mind would just quiet down. Lord, I pray for peace that surpasses understanding in this room. For some of you, I pray for you, it's to get your time in order. I pray that you would go home and before taking a nap, that you would get, pull a chair out, pull your planner out and start to put first things first. You'd start to organize some things. For others, it's getting your finances in order, putting first things first there. Some of you need to get in the financial peace group we're doing this semester. Some of you... you, just need to get in a group if you're not in one. Lord, I pray that you would just open doors and no man can close in that area, that it would be clearly obvious which group we're to be a part of.
Yes, Jesus. For some of you in here, when I talked about knowing God, that was new to you. You've known God as somebody far away, somebody distant, somebody who is casting judgment and really doesn't care about you or your life. Or you've, I hear that, or you've known him as a father you have to please. And I just pray that those lies would fall down in the name of Jesus and the spirit of sonship, of relationship would be released in this room, that you would see him as a near and close Jesus who wants a relationship with you. If you've never taken that step to begin a relationship with Jesus, I like to say it this way, if you've never given the Lord control of your life, if you've never surrendered the controls of your life to Jesus, I want to do that with you right now. And so with every head bowed and every eye closed, I'm not going to make you stand up or come down front no, I want to pray with you right where you are. And I'm going to lead you in a prayer. But it's if you've never surrendered the controls of your life to Jesus. For some of you, it's you're far from God and you know you're not, supposed, you're not where you're supposed to be. You need to be close to God. You need to, you've taken the controls back. Let me say it that way. You've taken the controls of your life back and you need to give them back to Jesus. If I'm describing you, you're like, Samuel, that is me. I want you to pray with me. And I'm going to lead you in a prayer right in your seat. So with every head bowed, every eye closed, what I'm going to do is I'm going to lead you in a prayer. The Bible says we are to acknowledge God, though, to acknowledge God as Lord. And so what I want to do is if you're going to pray with me, if you're saying, Samuel, that is me, I need to pray that prayer with you, what I want you to do is right where you are, lift up your hand and raise it up high so I can see who I'm praying with. Yep, I see that. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, yep. Leave it up so I can see it. Yep. Yep, I see that. Praise God, yeah. Yes. All right, you can put your hands down. All right, right where you are, I want you to pray with me. If you raised your hand, if you need to take this step, right where you are, would you pray? You, you can repeat the words after me, just make it sincere for yourself. Repeat after me, would you say, Jesus? Yes. Thank you for paying for my sins. Thank you for going to the cross and for dying for me. Today I receive what you did for me. Today I surrender the controls to you. Say it this way, Jesus be my Lord. Yes. Make it personal. Say, Jesus be my number one. Yes. With all of my heart, I'm going to live for you starting today. I give you my life. Lord, I pray for every person who just prayed that prayer with me. Lord, I pray that their life would never be the same. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray for peace as they walk out of these doors, that stress would have no hold on them, that they would be uh, overcomers because your spirit is within them. Lord, I thank you. Lord, all the glory goes back to you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Vineyard, would you celebrate with about a dozen people and raise their hand? It's so awesome. Well, hey, we're going to close with one final worship song, and then we'll be done. Hey, if you prayed with me, if you raised your hand, this is important. There's a Connect card in the seat in front of you, and they're throwing up a digital option now on the screens. That's for you to check to let me know you did pray with me. You can put if you didn't pray with me, you can put prayer requests on there. But especially if you prayed with me, please, please, please fill that out so that I can come watch the Steelers game with you today. So, <laughs> No, I'm not doing that, I promise. No, seriously, it's so we can pray for you. If you, know, if you come to Saturday morning prayer, you know every week we have the prayer requests out there. And we separate it from people's info, so it's private. But we pray for you guys every week. And there's people that do pray for you every day. And prayer works. It really does. And so if you do fill that Connect card out that you prayed with me, we're going to send you a letter, an email with some next steps that you can take, and that's it. One of the next steps is Growth Track, which is happening today. You've heard about it by now, I hope. Growth Track Step 2 is right after this service. It's food. There's child care, free lunch date if you're married. It's less than an hour. 
Start the process. Discover your purpose. I invite you to that, okay? Well, as we do, we close with one final worship song, and we give what's on our hearts to give. Now, if you're a guest here, please don't feel any pressure at all to give. That's for those who call Vineyard Church their home. And those who do give, thank you for putting first things first. And it's a privilege, isn't it? We get to. We don't have to. It's life-giving. And so let's close with our final worship song, okay? Would you stand to your feet? Let's sing together. Let me pray us in. <clears throat> Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus, would you receive our praise, our worship, our offering, our tithes? Lord, would you use it to magnify your kingdom? Lord, I pray that more people are able to come to know you, to find freedom, to discover their purpose, and join us in making a difference because of our giving. Lord, we give all the honor, all the glory, and all the praise back to you. Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus, we pray.